Hello and welcome to this free PV lecture series of my on-demand FE Electrical and Computer Exam Preparation course. In this lecture, we are going to go over computer networks, cryptography, and specifically Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. Now, computer networks, I understand from most of the students, is a very intimidating topic because students generally don't, especially the power system students, generally don't take computer networks or computer systems or even sometimes com software engineering courses in their undergraduate studies and I recognize that and that's why within my on-demand F electrical and computer exam preparation course I have tons of content on computer networks, computer systems and software. I have upwards of I believe 24-25 lectures just on the topic of computer networks which can be a little bit overwhelming but I've done that so that even if you have zero background in computer networks you can actually learn all of these concepts and learn them in quite a bit of detail. Now within computer networks, there's some topics which are very dry and my personal favorite topics are cryptography, RSA algorithm, Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. And in this lecture, we're gonna see how elegant and smart this Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol is and RSA algorithm, which I discuss in my on-demand lecture series is again, a very, very impressive algorithm, which is actually being used for encryption purposes throughout the world. So let's dive into it. Hello and welcome to our second lecture on the topic of cryptography, which is a subtopic within network security. In this lecture, we are going to look at two concepts in relative detail. So again, as I mentioned previously, I've broken cryptography into multiple lectures and will focus on one or two topics in each of these lectures because uh, that way we'll be able to uh, look at them in relative detail. So the first concept is public key cryptography, which uh, I will elaborate a little bit more upon. Uh, we briefly discussed asymmetric keys um, in the last lecture. So this is just, will be a little bit of an elaboration. And then finally, we have the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol, which is basically the main topic of this lecture. Public key cryptography. Now let's look at a scenario Suppose that two parties have never met each other, okay, but they still want to communicate securely. They will have to establish a key in order to communicate with each other. But the question is that, is it possible to establish such a key commonly without ever sharing it over a network? Remember that our assumption is that the network is insecure. We always assume that when the packets are flowing from point A to point B, they can be intercepted. And once they are intercepted, who knows what can happen to them. So the transmission is always considered to be insecure, no matter um, how secure you want to make it. And uh, we also assume that 100% security is not possible. So now these two uh, parties or these two individuals, A and B, want to communicate, but they have never met each other. So they have not been able to exchange keys, right? So and you were, if you were able, if you were to send keys over the network which is insecure then that becomes an issue if the key gets intercepted then um, essentially because e encryption and decryption you would say okay maybe try and encrypt the key but um, uh, encrypting the key it's a chicken and egg issue right because um, in order to start the encryption and decryption process in order to implement your um, uh, cryptography scheme or algorithm, you have to have a, have a key. And if you encrypt the key, then even if you send it to the sender, because the sender still wouldn't have a key because that key is encrypted, right? So that's the issue. So is it possible for us to establish a common key um, that will allow the encryption and decryption to happen by means of using a public key, right? So that's basically uh, the question that is answered by the Diffie-Hellman ex key exchange protocol. Yes, it is possible and it was made possible in 1976 with Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. And this became the first practical public key exchange protocol. And this was developed by these two gentlemen. Now the underlying issue with the symmetric key that we briefly looked at in the last lecture was that with a secret key, if that particular secret key is intercepted by someone, right? Imagine that code book that we talked about. Imagine that um, uh, Caesar's adversaries were able to get hold of the fact that, okay, just shift everything right by uh, three uh, and shift everything back by three, right? Then essentially the game is over. 
Now, uh, that, that code book essentially was the key. Now, in this case, if we are able to securely exchange the key, okay, then that issue, that potential weakness gets uh, uh, taken care of. And this was first made possible in 1976. And since then, there have been other uh, public key exchange uh, algorithms that, been, that have been developed. And we will actually look at RSA, which is the more uh, famous one that's used. But uh, with the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol, this is essentially the foundation. Before we jump into the mechanics of Diffie-Hellman key exchange, let's uh, use an analogy. And the most common analogy that is given to explain this protocol is that of paint. Now, if you've ever, if you have a hobby of painting uh, or if you happen to have uh, used paints in school, in grade school, in elementary school, you would know that by mixing different colors of paints, you actually end up with, with new colors. Okay, so the concept over here is that there are two parties, okay, Alice and Bob, and you will find that in most of the text, for whatever reason, whenever we are talking about encryption, the two names that pop up are Alice and Bob. So maybe it's easy to remember because A and B, um, but uh, anyways, so Alice and Bob, they want to communicate so the first thing that they have to do if they want to implement Diffie-Hellman key exchange is that they have to agree upon a common paint, okay? And now Alice will communicate to Bob over the network and tell Bob that um, I am using uh, uh, yellow as a common paint and Bob would say, okay, I'm using yellow as a common paint as well. So the idea is that even if somebody who is trying to eavesdrop, if the message gets intercepted, you will see that in great, in the grand scheme of things, it won't make any difference, right? So the common paint um, is identified. Now, in addition to that, they privately have their own secret paint, which they don't share with each other. Okay, so this is the private, this is, this is key. So these paints, they also keep the private uh, uh, paints and they, that's a secret color. They never share it. What they end up doing is that Alice would add the private color into the common color. And similarly, Bob would add the private, Bob's private color into the common um, color. So Alice would come up with this color, okay, which is the result of the orange and yellow. And Bob would end up with this bluish color which is the sum of the turquoise and the yellow, okay? Now, these two are public because what they're going to do after that is they will exchange these colors, okay? These new mixtures will be then exchanged. But I want to explain this one very critical uh, concept over here. It is easy to add two colors to come up with a third color, but it is very difficult to look at Alice's new mixture or Bob's new mixture and tell that which combination was used because there are more than one ways of arriving at these colors and there's no practical way or no easy way of um, converting this these colors into their individual uh, components. So it is easy to go from here to here, okay, from here to here but the reverse is not true. And that's a one-way function. One-way functions are very easy to compute in one direction, but they are extremely difficult to compute in the reverse direction. So remember this concept, because when we look at the mathematical details, that will come into play, okay? So now that they have created these new mixtures, what they're gonna do is they will exchange these new mixtures publicly over the insecure network. So what have they exchanged so far publicly over the insecure network is the common paint and these new mixtures. So Alice receives Bob's new mixture and Bob receives Alice's new mixture. Now what they will do is Alice would basically add the secret color Alice's own secret color into Bob's new mixture, okay? 
and that will result in a third color okay and another new mixture and when bob adds his own secret color into alice's new mixture then he would also end up with a third color okay now this third color would be same for both of them okay and that becomes the common secret so that is the key you can see that eventually both alice and bob now have shared this key which can then be you so which they have shared it uh, but without really sharing it right they have developed these keys in isolation where by sharing certain aspects of this key in public and now both of them have this common secret which the network is not aware of okay the network only saw the common paint okay and it only saw the new mixtures flying around but the network has never been able to see this new color that both of them have locally produced okay and now without telling each other they know that this is the key this new color is the key and um, this is uh, the most critical component that it was ex it was developed without any public exchange and this can serve as encryption and decryption key so this is in nutshell the whole concept of diffie hellman and the underlying um the underlying uh, the, the protection is actually provided by means of this one way function because when they exchange these new mixtures right even if you intercept it you cannot break them into the original colors because there are so many it's difficult to break and there are a few different combinations and then how come both of them are ending up with the same color you can try this experiment yourself as well because if you look at it this particular the 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 common secret key that they have now contains yellow it contains red orange uh, it contains um the new mixture from bob right so it contains these three colors right and the new mixture from bob itself contained turquoise right so alice's um final mixture or the common secret contains uh four different colors um or i would say three different colors the base colors the base color is yellow orange and turquoise when you look at bob's new um the common the common secret color it contains yellow okay it contains yellow it contains red or orange from alice because that was a uh, part of the public um, publicly exchanged new mixture and it contains obviously bob's turquoise so this final mixture contains all three components okay they might be a little some might be a little bit uh, they might be a little bit more or less uh, paint color but you know the way the mixtures work is that the basic formation of the the of the new color really doesn't depend as much on the amount of color that you add so if you mix um a turquoise and yellow it would take shade of uh blue it doesn't mean that if you add more turquoise that blue would change into pink okay so that uh, that is what uh, helps this work and essentially it's a one way function Now that we've gone through that analogy of paint hopefully this has warmed you up um to Diffie-Hellman key exchange algorithm and you probably have a better understanding of what it is all about now we will go through the actual algorithm which is a little bit uh, mathematical obviously all algorithms have math in them but in order to make it easier i will actually walk through an example side by side because that will help you understand what's really going on with uh, by making use of natural numbers so in this algorithm the first step is that you publicly pick a prime modulus p and a base generator g okay if you want to keep it simple you would say that you have to pick a prime number p and remember in the first lecture i mentioned that for us to set up keys we basically use very large numbers 
So for example purposes, I've actually shown small number. 17 is a prime number. It's a small prime number. But in reality, this would be a very large prime number. Okay. And D, sorry, G is basically a base generator. Now, it has to be less than P. Okay, base generator, you'll see what I mean by base generator when I basically show you the formula over here. Uh, when I explain this formula. So this is the base generator, okay? So base to an exponent. So that's why it's called the base generator because it will be raised to an exponent. And prime modulus P is basically um, the prime number of, on which we will be uh, doing the mod operator. Okay, so simply you have to pick a prime number P and a number G which is less than P. But there is also a technical, another technical um, requirement on G, so it has to be less than P. And now G doesn't necessarily have to be a prime number. Okay, it can be any integer which is less than P which meets this requirement as well, that it is a primitive root modulo P. Okay, now what it means is that G is chosen or selected such that when we compute this, okay, g raised to power an integer x um, mod p, it will equally result in integer values between 0 and p, okay. So um, 6 raised to power, so in this case, 6 raised to power x mod 17 for a value of x, it will result in equal integers with equal probability or likelihood uh, between 0 and uh, p. So between 0 and p we have 0 and 17. Okay, so between these two we have 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 16. So g is primitive root modulo 17 if this particular expression would result in equal likelihood of all of these numbers. Now in most of the algorithms that you see, especially if this is um, an introductory level uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange um, explanation of it, you are looking at it for the first time or if you took this in your undergrad, um, uh, the math side of things, uh, which basically goes back to the number theory, uh, it's not as emphasis. In fact, some of in fact in in the NCSFE reference handbook, they don't express this particular condition, right? Um, they're they basically uh, in the case of Diffie-Hellman, they're uh, saying that uh, the generator value g and the prime uh, number p is shared. Okay, so you can keep it as simple as that. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background so you can know exactly how these numbers are picked. So NCSFE reference handbook is uh, telling you that p has to be a prime number and g is just a base generator number and on top of that there are these additional background uh, uh, technical details. Now that number x that I mentioned okay this number x is actually a private key alright so this private key both parties now we are going to consider two parties uh, one is alpha and the other one is beta. So each of these parties have to select a private key or a secret key. Remember the color analogy where Alice picked orange red, reddish color, and that was Alice's secret color, and Bob picked the turquoise color, and that was Bob's um, secret color. If you wanna go back, you can just pause this here and go back and look at the paint analogy and um, that will that will basically uh, help you understand this step and consider these private keys as those secret panes okay there's a condition on these private keys that it has to be less than p minus 1 so we have selected p is equal to 17 now this these numbers that you select as the private keys uh, have to be less than 16 okay less than p minus 1 so alpha has picked x equal to 4 so x is alpha's private key and beta has picked y as 5 as the private key now each party generates and communicate this g raised to power private key mod p okay now this is publicly traded okay 
so alpha will compute g raised to power x mod b okay so bob doesn't know about alpha's x and uh, sorry beta doesn't know about alpha's x and alpha doesn't know about beta's y but they compute g raised to power x mod b which is 6 raised to power 4 mod 17 which results in 4 and beta computes 6 raised to power 5 mod 17 which results in 7 so if you don't know the mod operator i'd recommend you to quickly refresh it basically what happens is that mod calculates the remainder when you div fully divide uh, two numbers so uh, 6 raised to power 4 when divided by 17 okay uh, whatever that whatever the remainder is of this calculation becomes the mod similarly 6 raised to power uh, 5 mod 17 so this is 6 raised to power 5 okay mod 17 uh, sorry mod 17 and whatever is the remainder over here would be the, um, the the result of this calculation let's look at a very simple example so if I want to divide 9 by 2 so I know that 2 times 4 is 8 and the remainder is 1 so 9 mod 2 will actually be equal to 1. Now obviously you don't want to be performing these mod calculations by hand on exam so I would recommend you to uh, look at the mod operation spend a couple of minutes and find out how to calculate the mod operation in your calculator. Um, I'm pretty sure that um, all of these calculators have uh, so I've already verified it on Casio uh, FX 115 ES and uh, the Texas instrument and the HP calculators that are approved by NCS would have this functionality as well. So, so coming back to this algorithm, so uh, alpha uh, generates, uh, performs this calculation and um, this number is then uh, transmitted to Bob over the insecure network. Now it's just a coincidence that it also happens to be the private key okay and that's just a coincidence but uh, this uh, this is uh, this is not necessary okay it just happens to be that both of these numbers are exactly the same and beta will basically uh, publicly transfer 7 over to alpha now what alpha does is that the b which is 7 b is equal to 7 that beta sent over the public network it will raise that to x again x is the private key that alpha has and perform mod p on it so 7 raised to power 4 mod 17 will give you 4 okay and beta will basically do the same thing with alpha's a so alpha's a was equal to 4 it will raise it to y again y has not been shared with anyone it is the private key that beta has and it will perform mod 17 on it and C both of them arrive at 4 now 4 is the key which is common secret and it has been developed I wouldn't say transmitted because it was never transmitted they never exchanged uh, 4 as the encryption and decryption key but they locally developed this key without ever exchanging it. And how does this trick work? This trick worked because uh, it works because when you look at it, what we did was g raised to power x mod p raised to power y, right? So g raised to power x mod p was this calculation, okay? So we raised that to y when, when uh, beta was actually performing this operation a raised to power y. I'll actually remove these marks. So g raised to power x mod p is actually a, right? And this a was given to beta by alpha. And beta raised it to y, so raised it to y, and the mod p operation was common. So this is actually the same operation as g raised to power mod p which is raised to power raised to x okay g raised to power mod p was what beta did and it sent it over to alpha and this is essentially b so the difference is that 
you know that a raised to power x raised to power raised to power y is the same as a raised to power y raised to power x right it's just the order of operation is different but they will end up with the same result so in this case what is a one way function the one way function is that without knowing these x and y you won't be able to arrive at the common secret just like the example that we did with the paints right you know the publicly traded um, or the transmitted paints uh, they were 4 and 7 right they are 4 and 7 in this case but how you arrive at 4 and 7 that is not um, that is not made public and without knowing that you won't really be able to decode it so another caution is that it is simply a key exchange protocol or algorithm it is not authentic authentication right it doesn't guarantee that alpha is actually communicating to beta it just tells you that alpha was able to establish a common key with the receiver now we still have to do authentication because that receiver could be someone other than beta okay so suppose that message is being uh, rerouted uh, to an eavesdropper or an intruder now the intruder might be able uh, to get hold of this communication channel and establish a key a common key with alpha and alpha can start communicating so it's not aut authentication authentication we had a dedicated lecture on authentication as part of network security and that was the reason why i wanted to discuss it completely independently because that is another layer right or in fact that is the first layer because if you don't know who you are letting into the network or who you are communicating with then there is no point so diffie hellman key exchange does not let you authenticate an, um, the user but it allows you to establish a, C, um, a common secret key okay so don't confuse it with authentication so it is a once you have the key now okay now you would be asking where is the encryption going on well once you have the key you can use that key for encryption you can use whatever technique you want to use right you can use des you can use uh, um, aes the block cipher technique or even simply now if, if if four was a number that back in the day caesar was let's say um, communicating with uh, his military outlets and he was saying that okay um, starting today rather than rather than x I am going to be uh, shifting all the words by Y, right? So X, if the um, adversaries were able to find out that Caesar was shifting everything by three, right? Now they don't know what this Y is. And this Y is actually equal to four because his military outlets, he's, he's established that locally with them, right? So instead of, instead of, um, instead of three, now he is shifting everything by y but what is y y is a secret key which uh, they would locally know is four right so obviously it's not used with substitution cipher it is used with uh, block cipher which is the more advanced version that we briefly looked at the des and the aes but once you establish the key then essentially you can uh, make use of those uh, encryption techniques now what is publicly known over here and what is secret okay so discovering the common secret key even with the publicly uh, known details now the publicly known details i am not sure if i yeah so publicly pick a prime number and the base generator okay so p and g so these are public all right p is public and g is public let's say the intruder also knows that you're using diffie hellman key exchange all right so the intruder knows that okay they are performing these operations okay uh, X is not known, but they know that G raised to power some secret key is being exchanged, okay, and uh, mod P and G raised to power Y mod P. So it would take, even with these publicly known details, it would take um, them the long longer than the lifetime of universe to break this, okay, and this is because the discrete logarithm problem so remember we talked about the one-way function 
So this one way function over here is a very particular, has a very particular name and you can look into that. I'm not going to go into details of this. It's get, it gets very complicated and it's out of the scope. I know we want to be able to review these concepts, learn these concepts, uh, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, but that would be a, a very tangential uh, trajectory uh, if you start digging into it. So understand this algorithm, understand why it works, understand how it works. Okay, the trick works because of this. This is why it works and how it works is this algorithm. Okay, what it does, it gives you these local keys. What can you do when you have the local keys? When you have the local keys, you can use any technique. You can use something as simple as substitution, okay? And more complicated as block ciphers, right? Within block ciphers, you can use DES, you can use AES. And technically speaking, it is essentially this concept uh, that allows this to work, the one wave function, okay? You can combine two paints to create a new paint color, but you cannot use the new paint color uh, to differentiate it into the components with which that paint was made. And we are sharing public details over here. G is public, P is public, but even with the publicly known details, it would be impractical for anyone to be able to decode it. And the catch over here is that P has to be big. So you'd say that, okay, uh, if P is 17 and G is six, then you know what? I know that X and Y can only take values between um, between zero and P minus one, right? So I have 16 or 15 combinations to try for X, 16 and 15 combinations to try for Y, and uh, I also know this, so I might be in business, right? Uh, that's true, if these P, if these numbers are small, okay, then yeah, the amount of time would drastically really, uh, reduce. But imagine these numbers being um, f five, 10 digit long, right? If your P is actually equal to um, a very huge prime number, then the range of X would increase drastically. The range of Y would increase drastically, okay? So that's when it becomes challenging. Using small prime numbers, is 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 basically easy relatively easy but with huge numbers it becomes difficult now for practice problems and for exam questions if you see like small numbers don't be surprised because the issue is that calculating this on exam with very huge number uh, becomes difficult right you might have to use computer um, and but but um, but in reality that's not the case large numbers will be used and that's what provides you protection so in this lecture we looked at two concepts which was essentially one concept background for diffie hellman key exchange protocol in the form of a public key uh, cryptography and we looked at diffie hellman key exchange protocol analogy using paint hopefully that helped you to get warmed up to the algorithm and then on top of that, the example that we did uh, would have put the real numbers in front of you and that uh, would have helped as well. So Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol was the first major breakthrough in 1976 that essentially helped uh, demonstrate that um, local common keys can be generated even without publicly trading them. So another issue that I think I haven't mentioned with the symmetric keys is that, okay, for Alice and Bob, you would say that, okay, somehow Alice and Bob, even if they haven't met, they can somehow securely transmit the keys, right? If you're talking about, um, if you're talking about the uh, symmetric keys, okay, there is some way that Alice and Bob can communicate um, because they were able to exchange the keys, right? But then if Alice needs to communicate with 20 other individuals, okay, and this is highly classified information, you're talking about um, consulate level, or embassy level, or uh, intelligence level uh, details, right? Then they would all have to maintain a bunch of keys, at, at least if this is one individual. And if Bob in, wants to communicate to 10 other people, then Bob has to uh, maintain that huge list as well. So that becomes extremely difficult. It's it's not practical. So there was a need for um, a public uh, key cryptography, and that was fulfilled by Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol. 
and in the next lecture we are going to look at RS, RSA uh, which is actually even more commonly used um, asymmetric uh, key exchange protocol. So for further practice I recommend you to check out the quiz and also consider study guide and practice exams. Thank you. If you found this preview lecture helpful, I am confident that you will also greatly benefit from the full course that contains over 150 lectures and covers all the topics that are found in the latest NCES FE Electrical and Computer Exam Specification. You will also get access to tons of quizzes and mini exams in this course that will help you get additional practice along with a bonus full-length computer simulated practice exam. This streamlined and well-reviewed course comes with an amazing 30-day full refund policy, no questions asked. On top of all this, I have also included a special discount link in the text section of this video.